How about if I just start at the beginning? <laughs> you can you can be honest. Because <laughs> you know what? They have the sweat equity that went into that memory that they're making with their friends and family. And that's what's important with us, and that's what the I Am Real World's about. Well, that's a great question. You know, one of the best things about a spring food plot is you get a second chance if it fails. Chasing Giants with Don Higgins. Brought to you by buyafarm.com, your source for farm, recreational properties, rural homes, and more. By tapping into Don's years of experience, dedication, and commitment, Chasing Giants focuses on the techniques, strategies, and dedication needed to harvest one of God's most amazing creations, world-class whitetails. Now, here is Don and co-host Terry Peer. Welcome everybody to episode 10 of Chasing Giants, brought to you by Biofarm.com. My name is Terry Peer, and I got Don Higgins on the line. Good evening, Don. How's it going, Terry? Great. It is, uh, this this podcast is going to be released on December 13th, Friday the 13th. And uh, I want to tell you something, I've, I've gotten probably, oh, five or six messages by social media with people worried why it's been a week and a half instead of a week since we posted our last uh, podcast. So I guess people are enjoying it when they're out there looking for it, thinking they missed it. <laughs> yeah, you know, my mailman, uh, he actually came to the door today and uh, he wanted to buy a couple of my books. But one of the first questions he asked is, did you guys quit doing the once a week podcast now <laughs> that the rut's over? So uh, Stephen Polk, if you're listening, uh, tune in about every other week and, and, uh, we'll have a, a fresh podcast for you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's been a week and a half and I think the strategy is, is we're going to do another one probably right at Christmas time. Um, but, but one of the things that we want people to understand is we don't want to come on, uh, buyfarm.com is, is a partner of ours. But we're committed to the listeners to only uh, bring a farm that you're familiar with and you have facts on it. It's not going to be just something that, uh, you know, uh, you read a couple paragraphs on and then put it on this podcast as, as a recommendation. There's a lot more research that goes on it. So if we don't have our basis covered with that property or it's in kind of the uh, uh, time of the year when uh, when we don't have a whole lot to report, we're just not going to go out there and just put a bunch of information for the sake of putting, you know, jibber-jabber out there. Right. We just, we just want people to kind of follow along, get an idea of what we do throughout the entire year to set ourselves up for success during the hunting season. So. So, yeah, so at different times of the year, I think we'll be on as often as every week and might be a week and a half. And there might be some times kind of in the you know dead period before we talk about spring planning and uh you know different times during the late winter early spring it might be you know every two weeks but uh Mm -hmm. we promise that when we come on it's going to be research the properties that we represent by farm.com uh is going to be properties that you have researched that you feel have you know um good either potential or good potential or um are just uh absolute rock star properties for people who want to manage and and chase giant whitetail yeah you know uh, buy a farm has a lot of properties listed there's there should be something for just about everybody um but but we're picking the jewels out of the out of the mess and and those are the ones we're featuring and i literally step foot on all these properties before we feature them uh, to have a look for them or of them for myself um so you can rest assured that whatever we're saying here i've already checked it out yeah so the buy farm segment will be a little bit later in the episode um we also have and on tonight's agenda we're going to talk about a really big announcement that was made earlier today on friday uh, well, it's not Friday now. We're releasing the podcast on Friday, but this episode is going to come out uh, right after uh, some people hear some uh, pretty revolutionary news for a new product by R- Real World that's being released. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, we got obviously our questions at the end of the episode, and we're going to talk a little bit about hunting. But um, I have just a um, a comment for the listeners out there. 
um, and we haven't even talked about this, Don, but we would like some feedback about what you guys might want to hear from the ATA show. And Don and I are going to both be at the ATA show, and if, um, you know, I know everybody can't get in there and everybody can't travel, but, you know, even with the partners that we work with, uh, give us some feedback via social media, either on my Instagram or Facebook or on Don's or Higgins Outdoors. Um, give us some feedback if there's something specific you would like us to look for or try to recommend or talk to people, interview people. We'll have everybody in the hunting industry in one hall um, and over a three-day period. So I think that's another opportunity if there's a desire of our listeners to learn something or hear something, we can try to take care of that uh, here in uh, almost another month in January. So... Uh, keep that in mind. Give us some feedback. We'll uh, we'll try to take care of that. Um, we can pack our podcast stuff and head to the show and, and try to do that for people. So uh, we don't have a lot to report, but there is some good news from both of us on our home, or not our home farms, but our uh, our some of our hunting property. And gun season's over in Illinois. What, what do you got cooking there? Yeah, gun season ended, uh, you know, last Sunday evening, you know, the firearm season. Now we still got a um, muzzleloader season this weekend. And then there's a, a late season, uh, doe only, but, uh, generally when that general firearm season is over, I start getting excited about the bucks that are left that are still alive because at this point, if they've made it through the, the regular gun season, there's a really good chance that they're going to survive and be there next year. Now I know a few of them are going to get taken out by, you know, the bow hunting is still left. There's a good month of bow season. And, maybe a few by muzzleloader, but a lot of the, the properties that, uh, that I'm hunting, the bucks are pretty safe at this point. Um, I'm hunting those out of the way places, but you know, since season closed on Sunday, I, I spent uh, two days this week just walking properties and scouting. Um, I don't know how many different properties I've walked this week, but several, um, even a couple of different, uh, public land tracks, just trying to find a giant uh, for next year on public land. But two of the bucks that, that I really wanted to, to make it through the season are both still alive. Fantastic. So, that, so that's a good sign. Yep. yep. Um, I did uh, have a buck on public land. I uh, got uh, some photos of him earlier in the fall. Um, but I have not got a photo of him since, uh, firearm season, but you know, it's only been a few days, so I'm not too worried about it. Uh, he might've survived. He might not have, and I'll know sooner or later. Um, but then, uh, you know, the end of this week, uh, I've been consulting, uh, looking at three properties in Missouri and, uh, then one in Iowa tomorrow and then head back home. But, uh, the consulting season has started for me. I got a pretty substantial list of uh, properties to look at so far. I've probably got, uh, oh, I'm going to guess 25 or so properties um, lined up so far. So I'm getting started on that and hopefully get a few of them knocked out before the first of the year. Um, but I'm, I'm really on my on a search now. And, you know, I've done more walking in the, just this week than I have in the previous month, really, since I shot those two bucks in early November. I didn't want to put much pressure on any of the places I hunt, so I kind of uh, stayed away and, and did other things. And but now that the firearm season's over, I'm I'm gung ho looking for bucks for next year. Yep, um, I pulled cards on my home farm um, here in Kentucky, and the uh, I had two shooters on my farm and shot the first one in September. And the second one's still alive. He made it through gun season. Now, we do have a muzzle, late muzzleloader season that comes in uh, this this Saturday, the 14th. And it runs through that week and the following weekend. But our late muzzleloader here is very similar to Illinois. There's not many people that hunt. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that. Yeah, I don't even know that anybody really around me hunts that. If they make it through rifle season, it's very similar to you. They have a really good chance of, of making it through. Now, one interesting thing I want to talk about real quick is since I shot my buck and tagged out in Kentucky, 
I immediately shifted my focus to Illinois. And I never even went back to my farm and kind of adjusted my trail cameras off food sources from early season and moved them to scrapes and everything. So my, my trail cameras are still set up for over food sources, um, which is, you know, going to be real world beans and deadly dozen. Um, when you're do- scouting right now on these other properties, are you shifting your cameras back to food sources and watching those? Are you pulling the cameras that are on scrapes or are you going to leave them on scrapes for a while? No, I've, I'm, I've actually been shifting cameras, uh, from the rutting locations, scrapes, you know, things like yep. that to those beat down trails that are coming to the prime food sources. Right. Um, a lot of the, the pictures I'm going to get are going to be at night, especially in the beer box. But when you get those bad weather fronts coming through, you'll get some daylight pictures as well. Um, but I'll, I'm focused on the food, although the, the cameras aren't usually right on the food source, but are right. on a major, major trail leading to the food source. Yeah, when I was at your master class um, last winter, I remember one of the students asking similar questions to this, and and I'm I'm not going to be able to answer verbatim, and you can kind of expand on it, but you made the statement that you really don't care if you get a picture in the daytime. What you're using the camera for is inventory to see if the buck's there, your hunting strategy during the, whichever time of the year is going to dictate where you're going to hunt. You just need to know if the buck's in the area or not. So putting it right up against a tree stand or putting it right up against a food, uh, I don't think you want to pressure that area that much, whether it's by the camera or going in and out checking the cards. You just want it on a major area that you can pick it up at any time of the day, right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I think, uh, you know, I, I use trail cameras a little different than most hunters. And, you know, most guys are, have got them out there and they're trying to pick up on a pattern that they can immediately jump on and start hunting. And, you know, if I've got a picture of a buck that I want to target on a specific property, well, I've, I already know where to kill him on the property. I don't, I don't need the camera to tell me where to put my stand. I know where to put my stand. I just need to know who's there. Right. Um, is there a shooter buck there or not? If he's there, I know where to go kill him. Um, so I'm using the cameras and I don't care if the picture's at night, you know. Um, right now, you know, this late in the season, I pretty much have a good idea where the bucks are bedding. Um, it's going to be where there's been the least amount of hunting pressure and human intrusion. So they're, they're pushed into those pockets and, and I got a pretty good idea of this point to, where they are as well. So I'll set my cameras outside of that. Right. Yeah. I don't want to go in there and bump them out and chase them somewhere else. Then you got to go find them again. So, uh, if I suspect there might be a shooter buck in a, um, you know, particular sanctuary, you know, I'll set my cameras out around the edge and I can tell, you know, if I get his picture within an hour of dark, you know, he didn't come from three miles away. I mean, you're pretty close to where he was bedded. So, that's just uh, one way I use cameras a little bit different than a lot of hunters. Yeah, and, and Kentucky's a little bit different. Uh, obviously, I'm tagged out, and I, you know, we want to keep those food sources in our area. To you know, I, I'm I'm kind of like you in that case. This farm doesn't, my farm does not get pressure really during the rut because normally I'm tagged out in Kentucky early. And I've shifted my focus to Illinois. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to leave my farm alone, except for taking my kids on it. You're trying to leave your farm alone during gun season to let those deer come in and have the food source there and the bedding there to keep them. Now, with Kentucky, we can supplemental feed. So, you know, I'm throwing the complete feed at them uh, this time of year because my soybeans, um, you know, I'm, I'm not able to plant a big, big crop of soybeans. So with the deer numbers that I have, uh, I rely a lot on, um, on supplemental feeding. So in some cases with that, you know, obviously I got a trail camera on the feeder for that purpose. It's a little bit different situation than what you have in Illinois where you can't do that, but, uh, definitely trying to keep those deer there and keep inventory. 
uh, I've, uh, you know, living in Illinois, I don't have the opportunity to supplemental feed. So I've just got to monitor my food plots each year and make sure that, that I've got enough food to, to get the deer herd through the winter. I don't want to feed them half the winter and, and then have them take off and disperse. I want to keep them here all winter and let them disperse in the spring. And so, you know, every spring I'm checking out my food plots and seeing the, if, if there's any food left. If there's not, I'm expanding and uh, planting more acres the next year. Um, it it kind of, you know, comes and goes with the deer herd, you know, when the herd's up and there's more deer here, well, I need more food. So I need to stay on top of monitoring that. And uh, that's just one of the things you got to do when you're not allowed to supplemental feed. Right. Well, I want to segue and use two points that you, we just kind of talked about and using trail cameras and, you know, whether or not we get them in the day or night right now, we just want to know that that buck's alive. And, you know, and sometimes the pictures of the buck are a little bit further away than right in front of the camera. Um, you know, that's the other reason we really like the Reconyx camera. The night quality pictures are phenomenal. But I've spent a lot of time on your farm, and one of the things that your farm you've created is using uh, edges, screen product, bedding grasses, uh, aligned with food in strategic areas to tre- create travel corridors, to, to create screens for f- the feeling of security, and allowing those deer to, to come back and forth and then obviously have that spot on a heavy trail or a heavy used area to get the picture. Um, Real World had a big announcement earlier today, and I'm gonna let I'm gonna let you kind of lead off with it, and we're gonna talk sure. about it. But this is a product that you have trusted on your farm for many years, and me as a visitor to your farm, it's just phenomenal what it provides as screening, security, and uh, travel corridors for animals on your property. Yeah. Um just a note about my farm. I've, you know, tweaked the setup over the years and I've got it right now where any buck that shows up here that I want to kill, I can kill him. Now I'm not saying I can go out and do it in, in a week, but in the course of a season, if there's a buck here that I want to shoot in the course of a season, I'm going to get him shot. And, uh, you know, part of that setting it up, uh, is the screening cover, um, making the deer feel comfortable. Uh, blocking the view and, and, uh, you know, any pressure that they might feel. Um, if you can keep them from seeing it, then, uh, they're a mature buck, especially is more likely to, to lay tight than to get up and flee. So, uh, that secure bedding cover is key, but if you can have some screening around it, you can make it even better. And several years ago, I, I planted a, a new plant for me called the uh, miscanthus. Uh, miscanthus is a tall grass. You've got a, it's a sterile plant. It's non-invasive. Uh, it only spreads a few inches a year. Uh, you got to plant a little piece of a root called a rhizome. So this root rhizome is a piece of root. that's about say five or six inches long. Almost looks like and, a piece of ginger at the supermarket for people to yep. kind of visualize it. All right. And you just plant these little pieces of root in a row about 18 inches apart. And then you, you, for a good screening, you want about three to five rows of it. But anyway, you've seen the rows that are on my farm, Terry, and they've been there for several years. And this stuff gets at least 12 feet tall, depending on your soil, you know, but, um, well, on average, it's going to be about 12 feet tall. It's going to have stalks that are just like bamboo. I mean, they, they stand all winter. Um, Over the years, a lot of real-world customers have asked us when we're going to come out with a plot screen, and we've tested just every annual seed we could come up with, the Egyptian wheat, and you just name it, go right on down the line. And and it does a great job when it's green in the summer. It looks fantastic. And if you notice the the folks that do sell it, they're always showing a picture of it green. Never in Um, the late winter. Never. Yeah. You don't see those pictures with the snow on the ground, and yeah. there's a reason for it, because it all breaks over, and uh, you barely got enough cover to hide a rabbit. Um, 
you know, it's about knee high once it's broke over. It's doing absolutely nothing for screening. Well, this miscanthus, on the other hand, it, it remains standing as well as anything. Those stalks are like bamboo. And uh, come spring, you still got a 12 foot wall. And it doesn't matter how much it snows or anything, it'll actually act like a snow fence. The snow will drift yep. up against it. Absolutely. And, uh, but, uh, we seen how well it worked and we, and after testing all these annual seeds that just weren't cutting it, uh, we started doing some research on miscanthus. Uh, the university of Illinois, uh, has done some research on it, has some test plots and that's where we started because we're not too far from the university of Illinois, but we, we expanded our search, you know, and we actually flew to, uh, some other universities, uh, to see other miscanthus test plots and, and in the research we, we've done online and such, we found out there's different varieties of miscanthus, just as there's different varieties of switchgrass and other grasses. And um, when we found that out, we wanted to see every variety we could. And that's why we took the tour around uh, to different university test plots, uh, to corporate test plots, and even on some private farms. Um, and we found the variety that we felt was the very best for screening because, the, and the reason for it is that this particular variety has a lot of leaf to go with the stalk. Uh, some miscanthus is primarily stalk with not a whole lot of leaf and the leaf that is there is down low, but the variety we, uh, found and, and we selected is, uh, is a patented variety that has a whole lot more leaf. Um, the fact that it's patented means that you just not everybody can just go out and start propagating it and selling it so uh you know we flew and met with the uh, the patent holder um saw their facility where they grow and harvest this and, and we actually through a oh a negotiation that took several weeks uh real world secured the rights to market uh this new miscanthus uh for screening and, and I'm telling you, there, there's nothing out there like it. Um, one huge advantage to, to this miscanthus screening is you plant it one time. It's not an annual where you got to go do it year after year after year. You plant it one time. And the first year I planted mine, it was probably six to eight foot tall. Um, not real thick. Um, but by the third year, I had a wall. And I've had a wall every year since, and I haven't done a thing. It's going to be a little more expensive to plant than an annual, but it's a one-time deal. Once you got it, you got it. One time, and Terry, deal. you went with us. Yeah, yep. you you went with us on the, one of the at trips. least one of those trips. Yep. Uh huh. So um, I've seen this. This has been years in the making. So um, you know, I, I know that both Don and I are with Real World, and this is chasing giants. But the the obligation we want to make to our listeners is ways that you can increase your chances to chase mature bucks and i'm telling you after seeing what i've seen on your farm and you've pretty much turned me loose on your farm if i you know you give me kind of some guidelines of what can and can't be shot but i think i've earned enough trust by this time if if i've been on your farm hunting by myself when you've been an hour away before watching what these deer do with this screen product, not only using the edge, so the height variation of two different products, but the security that this product gives the animals as they're feeding in the food plot, it's an absolute game changer for customers. And I've planted field corn and tried to do the same thing. I've used a uh, taller product that uh, um, has like sorghum and sunflowers and Egyptian wheat. And I, I've tried everything. And you guys, you and Wes at Real World has even sent me that screening blends that we had our buddy Dwayne at Kitchen Seed kind of mix up to test to see what they did here in Kentucky. And the consensus at Real World was if this stuff won't stand up, we're not selling it. Even if we don't land the deal on miscanthus grass, even if we can't find what we're looking for, we're not going to market and sell anything as real world that's not going to stand up and give us the results that we need, even though um, we could have made probably a good bit of money selling it because there's this fad out there that Egyptian wheat gives you this huge screen. Well, again, it does in early season, but it doesn't do what we want to do throughout the year. 
And uh, it was really cool going to some of these test plots because you, you basically go out to this field and there's just blocks of this variety. And there's this guy walking around with a clipboard and he says, well, this has that variety and this has that variety and this has that variety. You know, it's kind of like how we try to educate customers on clover. There's umpteen types of Ladino clover and each of them have certain characteristics that you have to get into the science to understand those specifics. And it was really cool watching those people from whether it was the corporation that handles it or the university that's done the testing to talk about all those varieties where we could sit back and say, we need this height, we need this bushiness or this leafiness, we need this standability, we need it to be in work in this areas. And you just go from test spot to test spot to test spot and see these, you know, small little sections of this product. And the beauty of this is that a lot of this research wasn't done for the outdoor industry. It was done for like biofuel and soil regeneration around big hog and poultry farms. So when you're talking about that kind of industry, the research is endless on it. So it was really good to partner with those kind of guys that had the science, the same thing that you know, our nutritionists and our seed specialists bring to our other blends that we could find this specific product that we're going to call real world giant miscanthus plot screen. And it released today. Um, it's going to be available for sale on the website uh, probably before Christmas. The website is up right now, I believe. But if you look at real world social media, between now and Christmas, I'm going to try to post pictures of different applications of miscanthus grass that you can use different ways. And there's going to be pictures of, you know, a, a country road where somebody's planted this screen down the country road if they might have uh, issues with people spotlighting and hunting from the road or glassing and you don't want people to see back in the field. There's examples of entrance and exit ways out of tree stands i know you've used it for that before there's people who've who've used it for uh, deer corridors to to get you know a buck from point a to point b he's going to travel that height variation so every day we have a different example and different kind of fast fact if you will to educate you guys uh between now and the first of the year around christmas time about this product because um, even though it might be a little bit of a pain to plant these rhizomes every 18 inches, it's really an easy process. We can plant this thing as soon as the the soil dries, or excuse me, thaws. You know, you told me that, hey, as soon as your soil thaws, you can put it in the ground. And, you know, when it gets up around 60 degrees, it'll start, um, it, it's real easy to take care of. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. It's still in the grass family, right? Yes. So, so herbicides for grasses, what, what can we, could we spray it with if we had a weed problem in it for the first year? Is it, uh, well, like two, four D would work perfect. Yeah. So, so maintenance wise is going to be really easy and it comes back every year, Don. That's the thing. Not only is it going to stand, but it comes back every year and that's just such a game changer. And it's kind of like that switch grass. Your first year, it's going to be there and it's going to work, but that second, third year, it's going to really pop and really uh, provide you with a, a solution that you can uh, hunt and manage your property completely different. Um, you and I have been talking for months as soon as this stuff is available and we get, we get to where we can uh, uh, ship it out. We're planting it on our farms as more of it as soon as we hit have uh access to it this fall right oh absolutely i've already got plans on my farm for probably more than i've got right now i'm going to more than double what i've already got on my farm in this campus and you know the the plot screen the, the real world plot screen story is just it epitomizes what real world's about um we could have brought a plot screen to market at any time and we are still testing annual screens we, we planned it this year we just can't uh, find one on that works farm. the way we want. No. And, and instead of putting out an inferior product that's not going to work, if I wouldn't plant it on my farm, I would not sell it. And I keep repeating that on, on the social media and such. And I think people get tired of hearing it. But I'm telling you, if I wouldn't use it, I wouldn't sell it. 
there's nothing out there that compares to this real world giant miscampus as now, far as a plot screen. Yeah, you all you all had me plant uh, a strip of it, and I put it. If if people go to my Instagram page and scroll back in the uh, summertime, you'll see my Kubota side by side, and this stuff is good grief. I, I have a two inch lift kit on my Kubota, and this stuff is four feet above the roof of my of my side by side. I mean, in the in the summertime and early fall. This stuff rocked, and I told you all, and I said, I'm not getting excited, though. I will see what it does. And we haven't even had cold weather and high winds yet, and this stuff is laid over. Now you're so, talking about the, the annual. The annual screen yeah, that you that, all had me test. And, right. And I don't have any miscanthus on my property yet. So, um, you know, we'll still continue to test it, but unless we find something that we're happy with, we're not doing it. And uh, this was an opportunity that we could find the right miscanthus, not just any variety of miscanthus, but the right miscanthus that's proven that will uh, really be a game changer for hunters and land managers. So I know I know this product is going to be new to a lot of people, a lot of listeners, but I'm telling you from the guy that has 10 acres that he's trying to manage that might have line of sight from a house or line of sight from a from a roadway to the the guy that's got a thousand acres that needs to funnel deer. This product is going to be a game changer that you can make an initial investment in that's not that bad. It's just a little bit more for the first year, but that comes back year after year after year. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't he tell us when we were at the university that there is actual varieties of miscanthus that is invasive, but ours is certified not to be invasive. So we don't have to worry about this turning into like a bamboo field and it just taking over your entire farm. Right. It does. If it produces seed to seed is sterile, it's not viable. Right. So this stuff uh, will grow a little bit and fill in on 18 inches, but you're not going to have it just take over everything and not worry about it uh, doing that. So again, not, it's kind of like clover and we, and, and soybeans, we preach this all the time. Not all products with the name are created equal. And we've spent years finding this and, and picking out what is right for the land managers and what we're going to plan on our home farms. And, and I'm just, I'm more excited about this product release than anything we've ever brought to us. And it's not a food source because I believe a hundred percent that even the, the guys managing and hunting small acres, this will be game changers to them being able to hold, protect and hunt mature deer. Um, I think this is probably one of the biggest game changers we've ever uh, tried to bring to the industry and a solution for our, for our, our customers. Well, the, the fact that it's a patented variety just speaks to the, the fact that it's different. Mm-hmm. I mean, if it was just another Miscanthus, uh, there would never have been a, a patent awarded to it. You well, know? We, could have brought, it, we could have brought a Miscanthus three years ago to market. We just didn't have the one that we wanted. Right. So... Uh, pretty big news. Pretty big news. Um, I'm going to be sharing obviously the 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 post from Real World site. Uh, so check out Real World's um, social media website, um, Facebook, Instagram, and I know Don will be sharing some of it on his on his uh, social media. But every day there's going to be the the thing that we're trying to do since it's kind of a new product for some people, even though the the technology's been around for a long time. Uh, we have accumulated a lot of different applications that people can use this stuff for. And uh, hopefully over the, the coming week and a half, two weeks, we can educate people to start spinning those wheels. How can I use a product like this? And, and these pictures are really impressive. I hope, I hope everybody checks that out. It, it's going to be a game changer for people and, uh, and not very big investment. So. Yep. Um, I'll also throw out there that uh, I've already uh, been assigned two articles, one by deer and deer hunting and one by North American whitetail on the scanthus. So um, if you get either of those magazines in the spring, there'll be articles coming out uh, talking about some of the applications. Not only can you use it to uh, slip into your stands and or blinds undetected, but you can also use it to direct deer right in front of your stands and blinds. Yep. Um, you can build that wall and the deer will follow that wall uh, right down one side of it and right past your stand. 
but but it's uh, we finished up the packaging this week on it, and I love the phrase that you that you came up with that we put across the top of that of that branding, the wall that won't fall. That's so, it. So uh, we didn't we didn't make any play for our boy Trump. <laughs> and, and relate it to a wall, yeah. but uh, we're building a wall on our farms this off season, aren't we? <laughs> the wall that won't fall. The wall that won't right. fall down. So we we hope that we got as you guys can. I uh, hope you guys can hear in our voice. We're we're really excited about this. This has been a hard secret to keep quiet, hadn't it? Because I mean, we've been yeah. working on this for a while, and and we finally got to the point that it's, it was time to release it. So um, really, mm-hmm. really super excited about it. If you got questions about it, though, reach out to us uh, via social media. Um, I'm sure we're going to have some submitted questions about it, but I think you're going to be able to learn more over the next week and a half by watching these pictures, and I think you reviewed some of the, the text that I had written for these pictures uh, last night. And I think people will be able to learn more by watching those social media posts over the next week and a half than, than anything right now. So, I mean, this stuff's good. Right. Uh, and you, you picked out some great pictures to use Terry. So I think there was 13 of them, uh, one, one each day for the next 13 days, uh, follow real world on social media or Higgins outdoors. I'm going to share them on my page as well, but, uh, this stuff can really transform your farm into something special. Yeah, and I, I can't I can't say it enough because there's there's guys that are like me. You know, I, I killed a six and a half year old buck that I watched for three years on a thirty three acre piece of property. Okay? So the people that don't think that we can't do it because I live on a piece of property or I hunt on a piece of property and I'm telling you, my neighbors hunt the crap out of my out of the area around us. You can still do it if you and and, and yeah, deer go off the property and they get shot. It happens. But there is ways and techniques. And, and I'm telling you what, I'm excited because this is going to even create another place on that small 33 acres that I can now slip into another stand location where right now I can't get in and out of a certain area without blowing deer out of the, out of the field. So, I mean, this is f- – for for oh. for small acre guys <laughs> and for huge acre guys, game changer. I'm telling you, um, going to completely uh, con- change change the change the scope of things. Well, it'll change the landscape. And you know, I've sit in my stand, uh, you know, on my farm this fall, and and I would look out across the landscape and knowing that I'm going to have access to this miscanthus next spring, and just been daydreaming about what i'm going to do with it and and i literally believe it. my farm is the best place i've ever hunted whitetails in my life same with and, i uh, agree with that it's my graceland <laughs> i really think that i'm going to make it about twice as good within three years uh and that miscanthus is going to play a big part of that so that, i mean that's how much faith i have in it because i've well, seen what it's done already well, talking about good properties, let's transition to the buyafarm.com property of the week. We got a doozy for you tonight. Buyafarm.com is your source for farm, recreational properties, rural homes, and more. Now, here is Don Higgins with this week's featured property. This week, we are actually uh, featuring two properties. They are on the same road. They're, they're separated by one property in between them. Uh, they're in Cumberland County, Illinois. Uh, one property is 166 acres. The other one is 245 acres for 411 total acres. If someone was interested in both of them, I, I've walked on both of them. So, so I'm, t- I'm speaking here from uh, firsthand experience. So right now on those two, on that 411 total acres, 45 acres of that is in CRP. Um, paying an annual payment of $9,600. But there's 236 tillable acres uh, out of that 411. So a little bit more than half of it is tillable. And that tillable acreage qualifies for the CRP program, which you'll be able to sign up for here real quick. In fact, the sign up may have already opened, but uh, I think it runs through next March. Um, but it's eligible, 236 el- acres is eligible for CRP at $193 an acre for 15 years. That's over $45,000 a year on, on that additional acreage. 
you combine that with the 45 acres that's already in CRP, and you're looking at over $55,000 a year income off of that, uh, off those two properties. Um, there's 128 acres uh, of timber and, uh, you know, creeks and such. Um, and, and it's not just, uh, you know, a straight creek that runs through them. Uh, there's a, it winds through and produces a lot of good stand sites. Uh, uh, agent Todd Ewing and I were talking about the property today, and uh, he believes there's at least 25 good stand sites on the property. And I know when I was there, I seen a bunch of them, so he's probably not far off. Uh, taxes are really low, less than $7 an acre on the property taxes. Uh, the seller is very motivated, so bring us an offer, um, Todd says. Um, you know, this would be a fantastic deal just from a financial standpoint, not even talking about the deer hunting, but the deer hunting there is great and could be even better with, with the CRP if you'd sign up the rest of that total acres for CRP, uh, other wildlife as well, such as turkeys and such. And right, I, I guess I, I another got, bit of, hold on a second. I got to stop you just for a second. Okay. Did, did you say $55,000 a year in income? Fifty-five thousand dollars a year. I'm telling you, it's probably. I don't know what the payment would be. I don't. I'm not even sure what the total price on this property is. But Todd said the seller is very motivated. Bring us an offer. Um, that's going to go a long way to making any sort of land, annual land payment. So think about and it's it for th- fifteen years. Yeah. So think about it this way: If my budget and I think I'm going to be able to go out and buy what? What did you say? This is one sixty-six and two forty-five. Yeah. So, so basically the people look, yeah, so people that are looking for say a 200 or acre around a 200 acre farm cuz they think that's what they can afford an opportunity like this at $55,000 a year income just off the CRP you just paid what half at least of the farm. I don't like you said you'd have to do the actual math when you get into it, but you just doubled the size of your farm based off the income that's coming in. Yeah, I'm oh, telling you, it's a wow. fantastic deal, and it's in a great area because it's it's not like a, it's in an area with a lot of broken cover. Um, there's a lot of ag fields. There's also you know a lot of ditches and creeks and woodlots and such. I mean, it's in an area that's produced some giant bucks, and still um, even has it, 128 acres of timber. And if Todd's Todd's a deer hunter. Even if he doesn't shoot a buck, I think he probably he's probably the only person that I know that I follow on social media that's in a stand anywhere close to the amount you are. I mean, I think he said every day in uh, the stand, if nothing else, he to keep blows trust, me away <laughs> just to keep trespassers off a of property. Yeah. So if he, he uh, if he's saying twenty five stand sites, he's he's pretty probably pretty accurate in that. Yeah, no doubt about it. Um, I mean, I I just can't stress enough what a deal this is. Uh, if somebody's I've, looking for a hunting property. Yeah, I've, this is the first property that you've brought to us that had this much income that was that was a, the farm was already eligible for. And the income being straight habitat, that's just going to make this unbelievable. Well, and you know, the great thing is, is this tillable acreage is not in CRP yet. So the new owner, he gets the full 15 years. You know, a lot of times you buy a property that's got a CRP payment. <laughs> it might already be half they, over. Yeah, or ready to expire. And the other advantage there is that you can you can design that tillable acreage. And you know, we was just talking about the miscanthus, how you could use it. Um, you can lay out your food plots exactly where you want them, plant native grasses, trees, and other pollinator mix and, and things like that, uh, a variety of it on that uh, 238 acres. Um you could lay it out and design it to, to be just, you know, a fantastic property. Yeah. And, and you know me, I came up through my company kind of through the sales organization. So when I see or hear somebody say motivated seller, bring us an offer and that much income in it. Um, I think, I think this is a property that some people that might think originally it's out of their ballpark as far as price need to probably check into cause they could probably get a deal and then pay for that property um, very quickly with with that kind of income. So, yeah, this is this well, is a little bit of a gem here. I'll throw something else out. This is only about thirty minutes from my house. So, you know, if there's a buyer from out of the area that that comes in and buys this, uh, you know, whatever he needs, I can probably direct him to it. Uh, 
need somebody to plant your food plots. I got somebody. You need somebody to plant your CRP grasses and trees. I got somebody. Um, I can steer you in the right direction no matter what you need. And, uh, and as of that, today, we know where you can buy your miscanthus grass. Absolutely. We can set you up with some miscanthus, <laughs> too. And I even, I even know a guy that'll plant it. So. There you go. Um, th- I'm telling you, this is a special deal. Somebody so needs to jump on Is this on the buyfarm.com website yet? I think it is, yeah. All right, well. Cumberland look, County, Illinois. Right. Well, why don't you give so Todd's, what? Todd, if you're not following Todd on Facebook and – and you want to know about the condition of Illinois hunting, that's that's number one. But <laughs> for business purposes, why don't you give everybody Todd's number so he can uh, you they can contact him. Yeah, t- Todd Hewing is the guy you want to call. His number is 217-663-8087. And I'm telling you, I, I met Todd probably 25, maybe 30 years ago. This guy is as honest as they come. He's a straight shooter. He absolutely will not make a crooked dollar. He, he's, his integrity is so means so much to him that uh, you're going to get treated right. I, I promise you that. Yeah, and Todd and I don't agree on, on on some things as it relates to hunting, but I will stand up for that man before hardly anybody else. That he is is a straight shooter. Is anybody what what you see is what you get with Todd, and and that's what you want in a real estate agent. So. You guys, uh, you guys actually remind me a lot of each other in some ways on that. So, <laughs> well, that's that's why we hit it off. Actually, it's kind of a story behind that. But uh, yeah, we uh, we might have to say we need a listener submitted question that asks <laughs> the true story of how Todd and Don became friends. Because I haven't even heard this story. I want to hear it. Maybe Todd needs to ask that question, or we have him on as a guest one night. Well, um, he probably wouldn't. Yeah, even I'll be. You think I'll he'd be do glad it? To share it? You think Todd would come on one night? Oh, I bet he would. All right, yeah. we, we might have to make that happen one night while I'm up in Illinois. Maybe when I'm up there uh, in this later this winter. So, all right, yeah. well let's let's move on. We got some good listener submitted questions tonight, and uh, I know we took a lot of time up on that miscanthus grass, but I'm excited about that. So let's move on to those uh, listener submitted questions. Go to buyfarm.com and check out that property. Uh, Fifty five grand yep. in income, crazy. Yeah, that's a deal somebody needs to jump on. But uh, listener submitted questions. Uh, the first one's going to come from Dustin Keesler from Cox Creek, Kentucky. Go Cats. Hey, yeah, there you go, Terry. You <laughs> might have to answer this one. In fact, he addresses it to you. Oh, does he? It says, Mr. Higgins, Mr. Peer. Uh-oh, my dad's not on here. Yeah, he is mine either. Yeah, I've been called a lot of things, but very seldom Mr. Yeah, we don't we don't need the misters uh. anymore, so... <laughs> So uh, Dustin says, I've hunted the lease I'm on now for the last nine years, and I've taken some nice three-and-a-half-year-olds in the past. Seems that if you let the three-and-a-half-year-olds live to to be older, they disappear and never return. I've seen this happen a lot over the years, hoping they would return to be bigger and more mature, but only end up seeing some strong and potential three-and-a-half-year-olds. The farm I hunt is 120 acres, 70 woods, and 50 crops, alternating corn and beans, and would like some insight on what I could do to bring those four-and-a-half-year-olds back onto my farm. Any insight would, would be appreciated. Thanks, and God bless. Well, Dustin, I'm going to tell you the number one thing. I tell all my consulting clients this when we start to, the tour of their property. The number one thing that a mature buck desires is seclusion, freedom of human intrusion. He doesn't want to see a human. He doesn't want to smell one. Um, a big mistake that a lot of clients make, a lot of deer hunters make, is that they got to stomp every square inch of their farm or their property. They got to find the very best tree uh, for their tree stand and, and in their effort. And, and even when it comes to habitat work, you know, every square inch has to be just the best it can be. And as they're running around scouting, hunting, and doing these projects, they're putting human intrusion all over the place. And they're chasing off the very bucks that they hope to kill. You, you've got to have the majority of any property needs to be sanctuary area that's off limits to human intrusion. Absolutely. And my guess is that that's probably what's happened. That why those mature bucks are not there. Um, there's just not enough security on on your property. That's that's my best guess. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, it sounds like a pretty similar situation. I'm not sure. What part of Kentucky is this? Cox Creek? I'm not sure where that is off the top of my head. I'll have to look it up. Um, 120-acre farm. It's not like Illinois. 120-acre farm where I'm from here in northern Kentucky. Um, if you look at a map, I'm halfway between Cincinnati and Lexington. 120-acre farm is pretty big around here. Um, I, I agree with you 100%. Um, I would guess that he said he had quite a bit of woods, right? 70, 70 acres, acres of woods. So I would mm-hmm. assume at least some of that that woods is is uh, thick. I mean, growing up, I wouldn't think it would all be open hardwoods or anything. So I'm going to make the assumption from Dustin that he has bedding. Um, but I agree with you 100%. It's probably pressure. And we've talked about this before. When I committed to trying to kill mature bucks, I had to stop hunting as much. So whether it's checking trail cameras or stomping your property or walking your property, um, I can tell you that the spot that my buck died in in September was the first time that I had been in that probably eight-acre block of woods ever. I don't shed hunt it. I've never been in there. So when that deer ran in there and died is the first time I'd ever gone in there. And I want to tell you something, it was thick. Um, So I, I, I agree with you 100%. Now, in Kentucky, I don't know if Dustin feeds, but I, I I have this theory, and Don might think I'm crazy. But And I, I've heard actually Lee Lacoste talk about this with his supplemental feeding. When I go in to feed and when I go in to pull trail cameras um, on my farm in Kentucky, I do it the exact same way and is close to the exact same time every single time I go in there. And my goal or logic in that is, is I want those deer, those deer know that we're there. I don't care what anybody says. I mean, what gimmicks are out there with scent control or whatever, those deer know that you're in there. So when I go in to pull trail camera cards and fill feeders when I'm supplemental feeding, I do it the exact same way with the exact same piece of equipment and try to do it at the same time of day. And my only logic there is, is I want when I leave there to be something positive for the deer after I've been there. So they're going to pattern you before you pattern them. I've heard, Don, you say that, you know, for years. So if I'm refilling mineral sites, putting mineral out, filling the feeders, I want to do it the exact same time every time. Outside of that, I don't go in, period. And and I'm guessing, you know, we got limited information to go off of, but Dustin, I'm guessing that, uh, since you lease it, is somebody else might be in there or something. But keep the pressure off, hunt when it's the right conditions, hunt when it's the right wind. And I promise you, you'll hunt less. You'll actually be in the tree stand less. Your prep time will be more, but you'll be more successful. Absolutely. That's great advice, Terry. You know, after uh, let's... after after you do this, you know, you might, the first time you, like, I, I knew that the first time I started going in and feeding this property, I was probably going to spook deer. But you got to think that after a certain number of years, those deer pattern you and know that when your scent's there, when you're side by side, when your tractor, when it comes in there, those noises, I leave the, the equipment running. I talk normal. I don't want to, I, I think we've even talked about this. I don't want to walk up on a buck and spook it, right? All right. I want exactly. that when I'm going in to feed and I'm going in to, to pull that trail camera, I want that buck to know I'm there. But the theory there is every time I leave, something positive, whether it's food, mineral, something, is being left for that animal. And over the years, I, I, I believe, whether it's right or wrong, I guess everybody has an opinion, but I believe that those deer will start patterning you and, and as long as you stay consistent in what you're trying to do. Absolutely, and you know, you make a good point. As long as a deer, a buck can hear you and knows your location, he'll lay tight. Mm-hmm. It's when you slip up on them and get close and spook them, that's when they jump up and bust and run out. So, you know, driving around your property with a four-wheeler or a tractor is not necessarily a bad thing. It de- uh, depends on where you're going and what you're doing. I mean, I, I don't advise doing it every day, but like Terry said, you know, same time, um, Use your piece of equipment so they can hear you, and you'll put a whole lot less pressure on your property. Now, when when I come to Illinois, 
where I'm only coming to a leased property or property I have permission to hunt, you know, I'm only making five, six trips a year there, right? That's a different ball game, Don. I'm only checking trail cameras when I got the right wind. I'm only going in there when it's the right conditions, just like I'm hunting. So it's All apples right. and oranges different. So with the limited information that we have in this question, that's the best I can answer for you. Yep. All right. Our second question comes from Kurt Mashing, um, M-A-S-C-H-I-N-G. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but uh, Kurt's from Aviston, Illinois. And his question is, what are the best tips you can give for hunting a property overtaken by the invasive honeysuckle bush? Um, you know, we've had a lot of questions submitted since our last podcast, but I picked this one in particular for a reason. Um, the property I shot my second buck from on November 4th, it's not a property I own, um, but it's a property that's got a lot of bush honeysuckle. Um, I posted some trail camera pictures of that buck after I shot him, and, and you can see in those pictures just uh, how thick that bush honeysuckle is on that property. What I did to kill that buck is I went in there last winter uh, you know, when everything was dead, and I cut a small trail uh, past my tree stand through that bush honeysuckle. I sprayed the stump so it killed it, and it wouldn't come back. Um, and them deer were using that trail like crazy. I had a little year-and-a-half-old buck come by uh, just five minutes before the path that I'd made through that bush honeysuckle. So get out there in the wintertime, get a, either a chainsaw or a hand pruning saw or whatever, and cut a path where you want them deer to go, because I guarantee you they'll use it. But then spray those stumps with something like Tordon. Tordon's a chemical that uh, will kill that plant. Uh, spray those stumps to kill it. And the, stu the stuff will come back in a hurry. So you're probably going to have to do it every two or three years. Uh, but those deer will definitely follow that path of least resistance right through that honeysuckle jungle. And uh, you can lead them right past your stand that way. Well, I, I guess I'm lucky because we don't have the issues with invasive, you know, whether it's uh, plants that go like the water hemp and stuff out here yet. So this the honeysuckle that you're talking about, I've seen it up there. Um, I assume that those deer like to bed in it, don't they? Well, it, it makes some, some really thick cover, but what it does is it kills everything on the ground. So, like, uh, underneath so it, all the undergrowth is gone. Yeah, uh, and okay. it's thick as can be. So, you know, a, a buck getting his, a big buck getting his antlers through it, you know, he's probably sure he can plow through it, but. Yep. Um, so, but what you're doing, just, what you're doing is actually going in and cutting it to create c travel corridors inside of the thick stuff. So, yep. so you're, you're just funneling the deer because everything else is so thick, uh, to where you want them within bow range then. Yeah. If you don't, it's so thick that a, a deer could walk through it and you can't even get an arrow through it to it. Wow. But, uh, you get them on one of them paths and then it's easy, you know, you got your shooting lanes cleared and the path where the deer is going to be, you know, right where they're going to be. And, uh, that, that's the only thing that I've found, but it, it makes a pretty slick setup once you get that trail cleared. But you want to do it early, way before season. Do it in the winter time before things green up in the spring, and make sure you spray those stumps with a. But you got to cut. Chemical. You got to cut it first, though, right? Yeah, yeah. Cut it and, and kick that brush aside, and then spray the stump, and um, just make a path, what'd and you'll you, just big enough you, that you could ride a bicycle down. What'd you call that chemical? Tordon. T o r d o n. Okay. Interesting. And, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's a forestry herbicide that uh, gotcha. is made for spraying on stumps. So, yeah, it's amazing. Different parts of the country have to deal with different types of invasive plants or different situations. Oh. But thanks for the question, Kurt. Sorry if we got your last name wrong, but you get a T-shirt regardless. So, yep. So we'll move on to the last question for this episode. It comes from Casey Kimry from Warrington, Missouri, and Casey says. The food with brows and cut ag fields. Hey, Don, I'm going to stop you just a second. For some reason, your phone uh, kind of cut out for a second. Can you start that question over? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Just make sure everybody gets to hear the question from Casey. Right. Okay. Uh, this question, last question comes from Casey Kimry of Warrington, Missouri. And uh, Casey's question is, if you did not have food plots, and the only access to food was browse and cut ag fields, 
how would you approach hunting in December? Along with that, what would you do if the temperature was above average, like it is forecast to be in the Midwest this upcoming week? <laughs> um, Story of my life. Yeah. <laughs> he just described well, he just described my well, Illinois hunting season. <laughs> what what you got to do it, after the rut's over, you got to focus on food because that's what the deer are focused on. Food. This evening, I was driving home, you know, right before dark, and the deer were out in. in harvested ag field soybean and corn uh just everywhere i looked um now what you'll find is that they have fields they prefer so you got to find their preferred feeding area on the property you're hunting and uh, you just got to set up between the bed and that and that food um if there's a funnel area between and that's even better but there's going to be a field that, that they prefer over all the others and, and you just got to find it You got anything to add to that, Terry? Or? Well, it's it's. I'm not sure if Casey's asking for just this year. I think he is because he's talking about the forecast for the weather. But what I try to do, um, if if you've listened to the podcast, you knew about me driving all the way to Illinois to hunt a specific farm with a specific wind, and getting there, and in the in the a day and a half period from when Don drove by and checked to make sure the crops were in the field, till I got there what 30 hours later not only had the farm the corn been picked but it had been chisel plowed so casey I, I dude i feel your pain i drove all the way to illinois and hunted a plowed field um so there's that side of it but i try where i can to work with that farmer to understand what he's doing and uh obviously if it's if it's harvested row crop fields and it hasn't been chisel plowed you still got a chance of food being there um, because you know, the deer are going to browse it. Why are they in that field versus the other Don's, you know, I agree with that a hundred percent, but if he's not going to chisel plow that farm, that field, um, you got a better shot at it because you're still going to have food there. Um, the second thing I would do is again, you're always planning ahead. So for next year, talk to that farmer and know whether it's on beans or corn. And if nothing else, if you're going to hunt there next year, try to talk to that farmer about going in and putting like an oats product. Real World has a really good winter forage oat. And go in there and the dry corn or when the beans start turning um, yellow and broadcast them oats in, as long as he's not going to chisel plow, they can drive that combine right over the top of it and you will have a green mat there to hunt over late season. So I, I know you're probably asking about this year. But as you can hear Don and I talking, we're always thinking about next year too and, you know, making everything better. So short term, try to find any food you can. Long term, try to get an idea from that farmer what he's going to do. And if he, even if he's going to chisel plow, if you could talk him into not chisel plowing an acre or a strip along the woods, uh, the field edge, and just letting you go in. There is not one thing that you plant in oats is going to hurt that farmer on. Um, it's just a cover crop for him. In fact, when Don and I were going around looking at properties, when was that, Don? Uh, in October, I guess? There it was, was there, October. There was farmers planting oats and wheat in, in, that, in those fields after they had harvested. So uh, it doesn't do anything, but but talk to that farmer. Know if he's going to do a fall spray with a residual in it because the last thing you want to do is go in and obviously plant oats and then him go in and spray it for the next season. But the closer on the same page you can get to that fa with that farmer and understanding what he's doing, the more money you'll save and the better you can make your plan to where you can adapt and, and come up with the best strategy for that late season. That, that's great advice, Terry. Actually, uh, you know, if it's, if you're on the same property, you should be building a relationship with that landowner anyway. And uh, there's a lot of those fall planted plants uh, that farmers use as a cover crop that are also used in food plots. Uh, for instance, real world deadly dozen um, or plot topper. You know, it's got the turnips and radish and things like that that helps build the soil. So. You know, your farmer may allow you to, to come in in the fall when those soybeans of his are turning yellow and have not yet been harvested, but you can walk down the rows and broadcast right into those standing beans some 
some uh, pot topper. He can come in and cut the beans, and as soon as he does, that stuff's just going to explode, and you're going to have a, a late-season plot. And I, it's not even really late season. Within a couple of weeks after he cuts those beans, that stuff's going to explode, and you're going to have a plot. So, uh, And you're actually helping him build his soil at the same time. Yep. Um, it, doesn't so hurt that, to, it doesn't hurt that farmer one bit. Uh, you just need to understand. You don't want to go in and put the expense of the seed down in the time and then him plow it under or him spray it. So get on the same page with him to make sure that's going to happen. But it doesn't hurt that farmer one single bit. So you can strategize and say, okay, if if that if that farmer's got, say, um, a 60-acre row crop field, where is my bedding on that property? And I might go in and put that in a strategic area in that field so that my late-season stand with the predominant wind and my right entrance and exit is going to allow the, me to catch those deer between that bedding and that food source for late season. And, um, you know, you, you, it's almost like starting with a clean slate. If you communicate to that farmer, hey, this little pocket over here, this area I want to plant, um, you can make a lot of work like that. So start thinking about next year and work with that farmer. Yeah, we're always talking about making taking a good stand site and making it a great stand site. So, you know, you pick your tree stand. You, well, you know where the deer are bedding. You pick your tree stand. Then you you got a 60-acre field. You, you're you not going to plant all that in, in a food plot crop, such as plot topper. But put it in the, in the spot in the field that's going to allow those deer to pass by your stand. So, yeah, a great like Jerry ex- said, plan ahead. A great example of that is the farm we helped some of the guys from Lone Wolf set up this year. And they had this little middle pocket of woods that had surrounding row crop and we didn't tell them to put the food plot or they went in and put uh they went in and broadcasted uh plot topper in on top of soybeans we had them put it a little bit further down and they basically could sneak in with a predominant wind from the downwind side from where they parked and they weren't on the, they weren't on the food source, but they were in between the bedding and the food source, just on the edge, so that the deer the buck had the right wind. But more importantly, as those deer came out of the bedding area and passed for a potential shot, if it wasn't a shooter, if it, if it was does, they went on past and went out to the food, and they could get out of their stand and get out of there without you know blowing the deer out of the food plot. So it's not necessarily always hunting right on the food plot. You you can work with that farmer and say, okay, I want to put it over here because I know the bedding is in this area. And now I'm going to find my tree stand that I can get in and out and then position that food in that open ag field to where it's on the other side. Um, so it's not just a matter of getting that shot. But in late season, the last thing you want to do is, okay, it's dark. Now it's time to get out of the tree clank around my backpack, lower my bow down, and walk through the field and blow every deer that's in that field out. You just you just killed your spot. So, um, you know, kind of start at it with that mentality for next year, buddy. Absolutely. So we'll be sending a Chasing Giants t-shirt to Dustin, Kurt, and Casey. So anyone else that's listening, you got a question, send it in. As um, we've been doing about three questions a week, but as we move into a slower season to, to fill some, some time on these podcasts, we'll probably start answering more questions. Yep, we'll so if you got anything, we'll be, right. able, we'll be able to knock out some more. And give us some feedback about what you want to see at ATA. Um, you know, Don and I will have business to do at ATA when it comes to the real world side. Uh, but but if, if it means something to any of our listeners to kind of see what kind of new bow Matthews has got coming out or find out some facts from their people, or uh, Lone Wolf or Conics, any of our any of our partners that we can go and bring those that that information to you. Let us know. One quick thing, Don, we gotta we gotta mention on Lone Wolf's social media, they're doing the Twelve Days of Christmas giveaway where they got a prize package every single day. I believe they're giving away uh, from the people that work with lone wolf so it's not only lone wolf products but real world is actually putting some stuff in there i believe i saw matthews lacrosse and a couple others in there so go to lone wolf um the original lone wolf by the way not the 
second lone wolf that uses the name, but the original lone wolf, um, and look at their social media, both Facebook and Instagram. They got some killer giveaways um, that they're having right now between now and Christmas. Yeah, they're calling it the 12 days of Christmas. So for 12 days, they're giving away a package each day. And, you know, it includes, uh, well, we donated uh, a bucket of Maximizer Mineral for each day, but Lone Wolf's giving away a tree stand each day. And I think lacrosse has got a pair of boots and, I don't remember I saw, what, there were several companies. I think I saw a rest and a stabilizer from, I, I guess it's Matthews. Um, uh, I believe that's who it is. Um, I hope I don't offend somebody if that's not who it was, but I, I'm 99% sure that's who it was. So, um, yeah, check that out. But but I shared it on Real World's Instagram page, and we had a bunch of people entering the contest on Real World's page, and I've tried to go in and and, and tell people you got to go to Lone Wolf's page to actually enter the contest. We're just sharing it to where you know about it. You don't enter the contest on Chasing Giants, Terry Pier, Higgins Outdoors, or Real World. You have to go to Lone Wolf uh, to enter into that contest. So uh, give them a give them a look uh, this holiday season. So um, we're we're kind of going to wrap things up. Um, I'm going to leave the country and uh, go on a little mini vacation with my wife for our 20th wedding anniversary. So even though it's during deer season and I got a tag, um, I'm going to get away for about a week, and we're going to come back with another podcast right around right before Christmas, I think is our plan, right, Don? Yes, and by the way, congratulations I have to you a, and your wife. I have, years. I have a saint of a wife that lets me – do a lot of hunting and spend a lot of money to, to chase these critters around. So I'm very <laughs> blessed to, to have found a good woman. So I think we both have, um, yeah, well, I hope you guys have a good trip. So, so well, on behalf of buyfarm.com who brought you that killer property, 50, $55,000 in income. That's, that's yep. amazing. So on behalf of buyfarm.com, real world wildlife products, Matthews, archery, quiet cat bikes, 360 hunting blinds, and who am I forgetting? Vortex Optics. I can't remember who else. Who did I leave off? I think you got them all, actually. And Lone Wolf Tree Stands. Uh, we hope you guys have a great holiday season. And uh, please, please, please uh, check out Real World Wildlife Products social media over the next week and a half. Learn about Miscanthus grass. We guarantee this will be a game changer for your property. So on behalf of Don Higgins, we want to say good night. February or um, December 13th. Have a good one.